Welcome to Through the Bible in a Year with Pastor John. We invite you to join us at 1 Oakley Avenue in North Providence, Rhode Island. This podcast is presented to you by The Way Ministries, supported by listeners like you. For donations, live videos, podcasts, and more, please visit www.thewayministriesri.org. Thank you and have a great day. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Through the Bible in a Year with Pastor John. So glad you could join me today to get a portion of God's Word. Today we're going to begin with Day 327, November 22nd, 1 Corinthians 15-16. to Problems with Doctrinal Error Overview Two final matters attract Paul's attention as he closes his letter. The problem of disbelief in the resurrection and to the collection for the needs of the saints at Jerusalem. Paul relates a string of consequences that will result like a row of falling dominoes if, in fact, there is no resurrection of the dead. If Christ did not rise from the dead, preaching about him is meaningless, your faith is empty, you are still in your sins, those who have died believing in Christ are without hope, and you are to be pitied above all people for your delusion. Then, with one gentle nudge, Paul refutes the first fallen domino. Christ has been raised from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15.20, and watches the rest of his conclusion stand up as well. Our hope in Christ is as secure as the historical foundation of our faith. Chapter 15, Prominence of Resurrection, verses 1-4. to Chapter 15, Proofs of Resurrection, verses 5 to 19. Chapter 15, Power of Resurrection, verses 20 to 58, Errors Concerning the Gospel. Chapter 16, Liberal Giving, verses 1 to 4. Chapter 16, Loving Greetings, verses 5 to 24, Errors Concerning Money. Insight, Fact, Not Fiction, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 9. What do you say to those who are skeptical of Jesus' resurrection? See how many pieces of evidence you can gather from 1 Corinthians 15, especially verses 3-9, to to prove that the resurrection is a fact of history, not a figment of someone's imagination. You can find more evidence in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20 and 21, and Acts 1. Insight, living today in the light of tomorrow, 1 Corinthians 15.58. In verse 15.58, you'll find a call to immobility and a call to action, both being and doing. Why are both appropriate responses to Paul's appeal? 1 Corinthians 15. The Resurrection of Christ. Let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you, if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important, and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James, and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I am not even worthy to be called an apostle, after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me, and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message you have already believed. The Resurrection of the Dead But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, 
Why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come, when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For the scriptures say, God has put all things under his authority. Of course, when it says all things are under his authority, that does not include God himself, who gave Christ his authority. Then when all things are under his authority, the Son will put himself under God's authority, so that God, who gave his Son authority over all things, will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. If the dead will not be raised, what point is there in people being baptized for those who are dead? Why do it unless the dead will someday rise again? And why should we ourselves risk our lives hour by hour? For I swear, dear brothers and sisters, that I face death daily. This is as certain as my pride in what Christ Jesus our Lord has done in you. And what value was there in fighting wild beasts, those people of Ephesus? If there will be no resurrection from the dead, and if there is no resurrection, let's feast and drink, for tomorrow we die. Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Think carefully about what is right and stop sinning, for to your shame I say that some of you don't know God at all. The Resurrection Body But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you are planting. Then God gives it the new body he wants it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. Similarly, there are different kinds of flesh. One kind for humans another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are also bodies in the heavens and bodies on the earth. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the glory of the earthly bodies. The sun has one kind of glory, while the moon and stars each have another kind, and even the stars differ from each other in their glory. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to life forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The scriptures tell us, the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people 
are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. But when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. The Collection for Jerusalem. Now regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, I will write letters of recommendation for the messengers you choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems appropriate for me, to go along, they can travel with me. Paul's final instructions. I am coming to visit you after I have been to Macedonia, for I am planning to travel through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay a while with you, possibly all winter, and then you can send me on my way to my next destination. This time I don't want to make just a short visit and then go right on. I want to come and stay a while if the Lord will let me. In the meantime, I will be staying here at Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost. There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. When Timothy comes, don't intimidate him. He is doing the Lord's work just as I am. Don't let anyone treat him with contempt. Send him on his way with your blessing when he returns to me. I expect him to come with the other believers. Now about our brother Apollos. I urged him to visit you with the other believers but he was not willing to go right now. He will see you later when he has the opportunity. Be on God. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. You know that Stephanus and his household were the first of the harvest of believers in Greece, and they are spending their lives in service to God's people. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to submit to them and others like them who serve with such devotion. I am very glad that Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Acacius have come here. They have been providing the help you weren't here to give me. They have been a wonderful encouragement to me, as they have been to you. You must show your appreciation to all who serve so well. Paul's final greetings. The churches here in the province of Asia send greetings in the Lord, as do Aquila and Priscilla and all the others who gather in their home for church meetings. All the brothers and sisters here send greetings to you. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. Here is my greeting in my own handwriting. Paul, if anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Our Lord, come. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. My daily walk. No doubt you are aware that God has a future program for your soul, salvation. But did you know he has a program for your body as well? Resurrection? Chapter 15 describes the future body God has in store for you. And it is exciting to consider. It will not decay, 1542, and won't wrinkle age, wear out, or fall apart. 
It will be full of glory and power, 1543, eternally beautiful and supernaturally strong. It will be a spiritual body, 1544, not limited by flesh and blood, time or space. It will be a body over which death and sin have no power, 1554 to 57. Best of all, you will be fitted with it in a moment, in the blink of an eye, 1552, with no waiting in line. Have you ever experienced a frustrating physical limitation because of age, illness, or injury? Be encouraged by God's promise of a resurrected body. Our friends take us to the grave and leave us there, but God will not. That is so awesome and something to hope for. We always put our hope in. That's all for today, my friends. It was great reading along with you. Have a great day. Keep up the good work. God bless. And I will see you tomorrow. Lord willing, peace.